and welcome to our presentation. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the forum. Um, I was counting back. I think this is at least the ninth or tenth year that TDSIG and QSIG have worked together on preparing a forum uh, for adult conference. And um, in typical years, we try a bit of a non-traditional style in which presenters work in small groups with Pechikucha or Kamishibai style presentations that they do multiple times to rotating members. Unfortunately, there was just no way that we could make that work this year, but I think that we'll be able to um, facilitate something similar with the breakout groups at the end. So we've asked the uh, presenters this year to take their time. Um, typically, they're just five to seven minute presentations, but today they can um, relax and talk for maybe 10 to 15 minutes about how they've developed community or seen community develop in their uh, workplaces. So I'd like to um, ask uh, presenters to speak in the order on Doug's screen, um, and I'll, I'll try to keep my parts brief and um, let us focus on what they have to say and our reactions. So could I pass it to you, uh, Matthew Porter from Fukuoka Jogakuin Nursing University. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. Um, yeah. um, today I'm going to be talking about um, being part of an interdisciplinary team. Um, I, uh, I'd like to begin actually by saying it's not going to be an academic uh, presentation. It's more of an anecdotal, um, a series of anecdotes about um, uh, my time at this nursing university. Um, I'm an associate professor uh, at Fukuoka Jogakuin. I left out nursing uh, out of the title. It's a nursing university. There's actually a Fukuoka Jogakuin university as well. Um, and we are uh, kind of related. Um, this might be uh, um, relevant to someone who works in a similar um, ESP um, teaching situation. Um, if you're in a more like general English teaching um, department, um, you, it might be uh, hard to relate to some of the stories. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, ah, sorry, things are moving. <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I wanna uh, talk a little bit about um, the affiliation of, um, the affiliation of um, English teachers um, who work with nursing students. Um, I've been told many times by my Dean that it's very lucky that I have the job that I have. Um, and uh, the first time she said it, I was kind of surprised and I was a little taken aback. I, I thought it could be offensive. Um, but I wasn't offended by it because I had done some research um, in, 20, on, in 2017, looking at um, the nursing programs at um, 159 private universities across Japan. And one of the things that I was looking for, I was interested in um, what types of English classes um, were required or uh, elective for nursing students, but I was also interested in who's teaching these classes. And <clears throat> scanning all of the um, online uh, syllabi, I could see names of teachers and I could also investigate where those teachers were, um, uh, who those, uh, what departments those teachers were affiliated with or if they were not affiliated with the university. And it turned out that um, there were 530 uh, instructors teaching in 140 programs and 60% of them were part-timers. Um, only 11% were actually affiliated with the nursing um, department. And this is actually kind of a big deal to me because um, I'm, I'm very interested in nursing for, Eng uh, nursing for English. And if there is no English uh, instructor affiliated with the department, that means there's nobody there to make curriculum changes, um, to make uh, informed curriculum changes. Basically, they'll just come down from somebody within the department who might not um, have a um, deep background in nursing English. So um, I, I think my Dean is right. It's, um, it's true. I've, uh, I'm very lucky to be where I'm at. Um, the school is called Fukuoka Jogakui uh, Nursing University. Um, it's a single department university, uh, which is fairly rare in Japan. Um, it's very tiny. We only have 400 students. Um, we have 39 uh, uh, faculty members, uh, teaching staff, who are either um, tenured or on um, one-year renewable contracts. Of those 39 people, 
uh, 34 nurses. So, um, and of those 34 nurses, 33 are women. Uh, so it's a quite a unique situation. Um, of the remaining five um, teachers, uh, we make up something called the liberal arts group and we are completely unrelated to each other. Um, our fields are disparate. Um, there's a psychology teacher, there's a biology teacher, there's a religion teacher. And when I was hired, um, I was the only English teacher. Um, today, we actually have a, a, a second English teacher who's on, uh, who was hired in 2018. Um, when I started in 2015, um, I had the opportunity to meet my predecessor and um, she had a, uh, a very different approach. Um, she had realized that, or she had come to the conclusion that teaching English to nursing students was pointless. And um, she saw herself as a um, supplementary uh, national nursing exam teacher. And so the materials that she showed me and that the students showed me, uh, they were heavily Japanese. Uh, they used a lot of Japanese. There'd be um, detailed Japanese explanations of um, diseases or um, treatments, things that would, like questions basically that would come, uh, that students would encounter on the national nursing exam. And there'd be a few sentences in English asking about like the main point of this Japanese explanation. And um, uh, after, uh, and also too, uh, on the side, um, she was <clears throat> the uh, choir instructor <clears throat> and she was um, also in charge of something called Tone Chime, which is kind of like a handbell group. So um, these members of the liberal arts group uh, at that time were also members of the religious, uh, the religion committee. Basically we're a Christian university. We have a chapel um, every day. And the religion committee was in charge of planning the chapel schedule, um, and planning a yearly uh, like Christian retreat. And so as a member of the liberal arts group, I was um, immediately just put on that committee. And this committee is not well respected um, by, my by my nursing colleagues. Uh, my nursing colleagues uh, are semi-interested in Christianity, but um, uh, basically uh, the students, the staff, I mean, the, the attitude is, is, is pretty much like, why are we doing this? Why, why, why do we bother doing this? Um, so, but from the liberal arts perspective, though, um, the group thought it was, you know, really important that we have mandatory uh, attendance, for example, and um, that we wake up students when they're sleeping in chapel. And um, it, it really felt like, um, you know, us against them. So in the first few years, um, the committee, the, not the committee, the, the community that I felt a part of was not a community that I really wanted to be a part of. <laughs> Um, we had no, we, we had, you know, uh, kind of a, at least 10 years between us in ages. Um, you know, our fields were completely different um, and the goals seemed different. Um, and so I, I really uh, reluctantly um, joined that group that I was put into. One of the things that I found irritating about this group was we had a weekly two hour meeting that was nearly pointless every week. Um, we'd have tea, sometimes people would bring snacks. We'd have maybe 10 or 15 minutes of business. And then we'd have, um, you know, usually over 90 minutes of just small talk. Um, and uh, I um, applaud their interest in English, um, but very, very quickly, um, there were a lot of requests to, let's try to do, do this meeting in English. Could you teach us more English? Could we email in English? And, um, I did want to try to support them, but at the same time, it was a new university. I had a lot of responsibilities that I was unfamiliar with, and I didn't really want to be seen as a um, distraction from, you know, their their work. I mean, and I mean, I hate to say too, they the liberal arts group has the the least number of um, of coma of credits that they're teaching. Um, most of my my liberal arts co um, colleagues teach under three classes a semester, um, uh, but they're involved in so many committees. Um, so yeah, that's where I was at uh, when I arrived. Uh, and I wanted to take it to a different place. I wanted to have um, relevant, authentic, patient-centered courses. My um, 
my desire is to be of service to non-Japanese patients. I want to make sure that, um, that the, the largest number of graduates possible um, can speak English um, to a basic degree, at least to make somebody feel um, welcome, safe, uh, not run away when they see a foreign patient come into a hospital. Um, that, that was basically my goal from the start. Um, so uh, from 2018, though, um, things changed. And um, I think I used the term multidisciplinary in my title. And later I realized that that was a mistake. Um, what I'm actually uh, interested in is something called a transdisciplinary approach, where we're taking something from one group, uh, from one discipline. We're taking something from another um, discipline. And there's overlap. And in that overlap, there's a creation of something new and different. And um, what is being created in my mind is, is English for nursing. And English for nursing doesn't seem to be a well-described field. Um, it's um, from what I've seen, it's part of uh, medical English. And medical English is a really broad term that covers um, doctors, um, op occupational therapists and physical therapists. And um, it could even include like um, uh, medical administrators, you know, people who work, um, you know, the, the, the uketsuke, the reception at, the, at, at, the, at a hospital. And um, the first academic organization that I was involved in is heavily focused on teaching doctors. And if you look at needs, um, which haven't really been um, deeply explored, there's been small studies on the needs of uh, nurses, um, but there's a big difference in the conversations that doctors um, have with patients. And more importantly, doctors tend to focus on research and presentation skills. Um, whereas nurses are more about talking to, uh, talking to patients and talking to family members. Uh, and the type of language needed for those skills are completely different. Um, so English for nursing, um, I think, is born out of a combination of nursing skills and, and um, a combination of a foreign language learning approach. Um, in my case, uh, 2018 um, started a new English program here. We were very fortunate. We got a new dean. He was very interested in um, helping um, hospitals um, handle non-Japanese patients. It's been, at, for at least a decade, the number of foreign patients has been growing. Hospitals have felt uh, that they um, couldn't um, treat the foreign patients um, in the same way that they could treat Japanese patients. It just takes too much time. There's a cultural gap, there's a language gap, and um, there, there wasn't the um, structures in place. Like there weren't uh, English speaking or foreign language speaking nurses. There weren't um, many interpreters, trained interpreters ready um, to, to handle uh, this increase, particularly in, in um, tourist um, cases of tourists who are coming to, um, to a hospital. So in 2018, we started a new English program called the Multilingual Medical Support Program. And um, it's basically like an English minor um, for our students. Um, uh, students come in, uh, they're supposed to have a higher level of English ability. Um, so they're supposed to you know, present some sort of evidence of um, higher than average. Um, English ability, which we're looking for B1 on the Sefer scale. But unfortunately, every year we hardly get anyone at the B1 level. They're usually at the A2 level. Um, but this was an opportunity for me to move away from my community that I was put into and try to, um, to find more ways to collaborate with my nursing um, colleagues, my nursing educator colleagues. Um, also, a second English teacher was hired. So, um, in a way, you know, I had a partner in crime. So it became a lot easier to um, to vocalize ideas, to discuss direction for a program, and then to reach out to nursing instructors and see how we can learn from them and um, adapt or collaborate um, in English classes. And for me, the ingredients for doing this, um, there are three, attitudes, language ability, and reciprocity. And in terms of attitudes, it was something kind of political um, that my dean said. She pointed out that the liberal arts group here is not interested in working with the nursing, uh, the nursing uh, instructors, that um, 
they were just kind of um, transferred from the other Fuku, uh, Fukuja, the Fukuoka uh, Geographic University. They were transferred here at the start of the university, at the founding of the university. They were never they never bought into nursing education. They show very little interest in what nursing education is about. And I've seen this come out a few times and been really embarrassed to be a part of that group. Um, we are supposed to, our group is supposed to manage something next year. Um, basically a class called human caring, which is kind of a capstone project that we do in our fourth year. And the capstone project is basically a, a deep reflection on a nursing um, experience, on a clinical experience. And my, uh, the head of my group doesn't wanna do it. He says, what do I know about nursing? I don't wanna do this. I don't know anything about reflection. I don't wanna do this. And at the meeting that we had with the, the other nursing group that uh, is currently in charge of it, I spoke up and said, I'm comfortable doing this. Um, if, you if you allow me to shadow you, I'm comfortable doing this because I've taught reflection before. I used to be a learning advisor. Um, I don't think it's that diff difficult, uh, not uh, difficult, but different. I see similarities in language skill learning and nursing skill learning. I think I can do this. And I think it kind of shocked my group, but it endeared me to the nurses. Um, so part of the attitude is having this idea that you can um, learn from your nursing colleagues, um, that you can uh, contribute to nursing education. So basically it was a shift from seeing myself as solely as a language instructor or um, a member of the language instructing community to I'm a nursing educator now. I, I don't have any nursing degree. I have no nursing training, but I am part of a community that educates nurses. So now I am a nursing educator and they see me in this way as well. They don't see me as a nurse, but they see me as an essential part of, um, of the, um, the four year um, curriculum uh, for language students, so uh, for nursing students. So basically it was a shift in attitude. Language ability, I'm fairly fluent in Japanese. Um, I've passed the N1 exam. I have a master's degree in Japanese translation. Um, my daily life is in Japanese and um, at home. And here at work, um, almost everything non-teaching related is done in Japanese. So this allowed me to to, to kind of slide into the community fairly easy. If you don't have language ability, you're kind of always, you know, kind of, you've got, the, you've got, you've got a, a natural wall that prevents you from communicating with, um, with your colleagues. So um, for, especially for newer teachers, for younger teachers, um, language ability, um, finding time to, to improve your Japanese language ability is, is um, I think essential in um, career development uh, in Japan. Um, in terms of reciprocity, um, I couldn't, I didn't think I could do too much uh, for my teachers, but um, I actually can. They need English um, help, actually. They, they do um, research. They always need to submit an English abstract, and they're always, they're always really um, um, put out by this English abstract. And um, so I've been really proactive in, uh, in telling them anytime they need support like that to come to me, to come to the other teacher that we're more than happy to help them uh, with any sort of language needs. But on the other side of that, in the give and take of this, um, we also need to talk to them, you know, um, and be able to learn from them, be able to ask them, is this okay to teach? Is this the way you do it in Japan? This is what I saw in a video from an uh, English nurse. Um, is this similar? And they've been great in, in terms of helping us with that. Um, sorry, uh, the benefits that come out of this are pedagogical and professional. And I'm going to go through really quickly um, three changes that happened since. And one is um, the curriculum for English for nursing. Um, nursing considers something called readiness, nursing readiness. Nursing readiness is um, based on both your uh, comprehension of, of nursing um, theory and your ability with nursing, nursing skills, your mastery of nursing skills. And English for nursing, when I started, I never, I never considered readiness. I just knew that my students had never been to a hospital before as a nurse. And if I'm asking them to do things that they've never done before, it's now just imagination. And students had a hard time with doing imagine, imagining, um, taking care of an inpatient, for example. They've never been there before. Um, so in the second semester, uh, we have English for Nursing 1 in the, uh, sorry, in the second year, the, this, 
first semester of the second year, English for Nursing One, uh, working with the fundamental nursing staff, we aligned it with what they're teaching. So basically the students now just focus on asking about symptoms, asking about pain and taking vital signs. And that's basically the limit of what they can do in terms of nursing. Um, we have a, uh, for the, for the uh, special program, English for Nursing 2 and 3 are requ required courses. And working together with the nursing simulation staff, we created realistic scenarios based on um, data about uh, the types of incidents and uh, injuries and illnesses that are most common in, in non-native uh, Japanese patients. We created scenarios based on those examples. And um, with the, the simulation staff's help, um, using the simulation dummies, we do um, this really interesting uh, approach. It's collaborative learning, basically. We give the students a problem. You've got this patient. Uh, right now, we're working on a, um, a, 30, uh, a Taiwanese man in his 30s who um, fell down the steps of a um, ship as he was disembarking in Hakata port. He hit his head, he might have a concussion, he needs to have his abrasion dressed. All of that's really realistic. Um, it could happen anytime, um, they could encounter it. And basically what they've got to do is they've got to figure out um, how are you gonna communicate with this person? He's coming in on a gurney um, and you've got to do an alertness check, a um, uh, alertness and awareness check. So do you know who you are? Do you know where you're at? Like those kind of questions. So they brainstorm it and then they act it out with the dummy. And the dummies, we can be in a different room and make the dummies speak. So the very last point is professional growth. Um, Simon Capper is in the room or was when I started. And um, in 2016, we formed um, Janet. Um, Janet is the Japan Association for Nursing English Teaching. Um, we've got about 200 members now. Um, we have a um, online journal, uh, a monthly newsletter, and it's been a great way to share um, ideas, what we've been doing, um, to get feedback on what we've been doing. And so <clears throat> I think in terms of community, I've successfully moved from an unwanted com uh, community, one like a, a mutt, basically, one what we were all just kind of smashed together uh, because we weren't nursing educators. We weren't accepting of nurse education. I moved from that group to the nursing education group. And from there, I expanded to a, um, a national um, community of um, educators who are dealing with the same, uh, the same uh, types of students. So um, that's uh, it for me. Um, so I hope uh, if uh, you have some questions, I hope we can talk about it in the group discussion later. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I'm going to um, try to keep the transition smooth to maximize time for the discussion at the end. And I'll just um, uh, say uh, on behalf of Wendy, she's sorry, <clears throat> she had some uh, admissions work that came up suddenly. Um, she hopes to be here for the discussion if she can get away from that, but I will play her video. Uh, so in place of uh, Wendy live today, uh, please enjoy that. Hi, I'm Wendy Goff. I can't be here today because I have to work at my university's entrance exam. So I'm going to pre-record my presentation for you. And my cat might join us as I do this presentation as well. Today's topic is about mentoring and creating communities. I think this is an important topic because we often have times when we need somebody's advice or help either in a professional situation or personally. And by helping each other, we can learn a lot, both as the mentor or the mentee. So basically, the mentor relationship is about people helping people. This is similar to what we do in our jobs, because teachers are also people helping people. A mentor is an important part of our life because there's somebody that has more knowledge or experience than us and they can pass on that expertise and knowledge to us. They might teach us about things related to being a better teacher. They might 
have a similar research interest or a similar educational background and can help us when we don't understand something or we need some help. They also can help us navigate through job hunting, issues at our institutions, or other aspects of our work life because they might have had similar situations themselves and they can use their experience to give advice and help you work through things. I think mentors also help you improve yourself or your skills. So for example, many years ago when I needed to start looking for a new job, my mentor took my CV and gave me a lot of advice on how to improve it. So I had everything I needed qualification wise to get a job, but my CV was not written in a way that was very professional looking for job hunting in Japan. My mentor gave me advice and sure enough, once I started sending out that new CV, I started getting lots of job offers. So this, in this way, my mentor helped me improve my skills, my skills for job hunting. But your mentor might also help you improve things like your teaching skills or your communication skills or your study skills, whatever it is that you need help with. My mentor also helped me improve myself because I used to be quite shy and nervous about meeting new people or trying new things. But through my relationship with my mentor, who was very outgoing and very charismatic, I felt like I gained confidence in myself and I started to try new things that I would have never done before. Also, mentors help you broaden your professional networks. So my mentor was somebody who, who was very active in JALT at the national level and I was looking to get more involved in JALT than just on the local chapter level, but I didn't know how to do that. My mentor helped me get involved with the JALT Conference Planning Committee, and he introduced me to many new people from around Japan through that. And as a result of being on the JALT Conference Committee, I met more and more people who were supportive and encouraging me to give things a try. That further boosted my self-confidence and finally I became the coordinator of the largest SIG in JELT. All of this was because of the skills and the confidence that I gained through being involved with my mentor and getting encouragement and expertise from him. So you might ask, how do you find a mentor? I think the most obvious is in our workplace. Most of us work with people who are more experienced than us or a little bit older than us or maybe have a little more education than us. And those are people that we can go to ask for advice. Sometimes people don't feel comfortable asking advice from people in their workplace though. And I think this often happens with women because we are in a more male dominated profession and sometimes they don't feel like they have a chance or an opportunity to ask their colleagues for advice. But that's okay, because your workplace is not the only place to look for a mentor. Look at your professional development groups. If you're going to your local job chapter meetings, you might look, meet people there that can become mentors for you. If you're in a SIG, you can volunteer at any level in your SIG and you can start meeting more people that way and maybe you'll find somebody that you feel comfortable asking for help from. So I think professional development groups are really a gold mine for finding mentors because they're full of people with various levels of experience but that also have similar experiences that you might have and who could give you advice and help you navigate things. And finally, social networks. We see more and more teaching related groups and Japan teaching related groups on Facebook or Twitter or other social networks. And these are great if you are looking for advice or help from people, but you don't feel so comfortable having a more personal or face-to-face -face relationship with them. 
you can still get advice and you can still get help from people even if they're not somebody who is in your immediate environment. So I think looking out workplace, professional groups, and social networks are really great ways to find a mentor. And they also are at various distances from you personally. If you don't feel comfortable asking for help from somebody who you see all the time at your work, then look to something like your local chapter or SIG where there are people that you might see but not on a regular basis. Or if you feel even more uncomfortable, look for social networks where you have that kind of barrier of distance through the internet. I think it's always important to pay it back. So every one of us has received help about something at some point in time. And if we've received help professionally, especially, I think it's important to turn around and help people once you've achieved what you want to achieve. By becoming a mentor, you're developing your communication skills because you're learning how to share your expertise or your knowledge professionally with people who are similar age or similar background to you. This is a little different than the student-teacher relationship with our students because they are younger and they might see us in a different light than somebody who is already a teacher in our profession. And developing these communication skills will help you in other aspects of your life as well. Also, you'll get a sense of fulfillment. I mean, who doesn't like to have people acknowledge that they have something that they can offer to benefit other people? When I was a SIG leader, um, younger officers in my SIG would sometimes ask me for advice about things related to their workplace or how to communicate with other people or even for advice when they were job hunting. So I really felt happy that they looked up to me enough as somebody that had experience that could teach them something. That was a great feeling. And finally, becoming a leader. As I said, the result of me finding people that could help me out along the way was that I became a leader in my SIG. And I felt that was a great way to pay it back because I was then helping other people. I hope you found this presentation interesting and informative. Whenever you need help with something on a small level or on a larger level, I highly recommend finding people that you could ask for advice. Find people in a place that is comfortable for you, whether that's your workplace, a professional group, or a social network. There's always somebody out there that can help you in some way. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much, Wendy. And again, um, she's sorry she can't be here. Hopefully she'll be able to join us uh, at the end. So I'd like to pass the baton right away to the next presenter, which is uh, Peter Burton of ICU. Peter. All right, I'm gonna trust that everybody can see the right screen there, is that okay? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, yes. All right, thanks. Um, all right, so let's, uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, the community of reflective practice that I've actually um, started at ICU alongside Mike and also um, Nick Kasparek, who's not, who can't be with us today. Um, and the three of us um, a little while ago, or about 18 months ago, we started a um, reflected practice group. And I'd like to kind of take this opportunity in, in this session to talk a little bit about the format of the group that we have, and then also um, reflect on some challenges that I have about, or the, the, the challenges that we faced, I think, or that we still face going forward, and some questions that I have about um, the role of community um, in teacher development. Um, now, 
Um, one of the, the most useful things I think for um, for me is quotes like this with, I think um, Steve Mann, Steve Walsh, they said that um, professional development needs a focus, a dialogue with another professional and reflection. And that kind of really informs my own views on professional development as well. So like I said, we, um, in 2019, um, when I started at ICU, um, the three of us got together and we decided to to bring these reflective practice groups to um, to ICU University and high school. Um, now this was kind of inspired um, by a long running group at Rikyo University, um, where I moved from, um, by started by Anna Laseva, who um, has left Japan since then. Um, but because it was then difficult for the three of us, Nick, Mike, and myself to get to Rikyo, we decided to start our own um, breakaway group, I suppose. Um, and uh, we invited, like I said, university teachers and high school teachers from ICU. We tried to do monthly meetings um, during term time, which was a challenge because uh, term times were quite different for the university and for the high school. But we tried our best. Um, and um, the main aim, like I said at the bottom there, is that we were, we were trying to reflect in a community, um, but to develop individually at the same time. Um, it was or originally open to university um, people on the same program as me, the English for Liberal Arts program. Um, and then we started inviting, um, we had a Spanish teacher come along at one point. Um, we had quite a few, um, we had a few Japanese teachers come along as well, um, teaching academic Japanese to international students. And from the high school, um, we had some Japanese teachers as well. Um, so we had kind of bilingual reflection going on. We also had PE teachers at some point, and it was interesting um, when they were talking about how critical thinking was applied in their classes. Um, so we've had lots of different people coming, and it's been really interesting to, to see. Um, to just talk a little bit about the, the format of the um, the meetings that we have. Um, we often start with goal, with reviewing goals, and then we finish by setting new goals. But in the middle of the, the, the sessions, um, we tend to use principles of cooperative development, which I know that um, I saw quite a lot of people like um, Mary and Julie and Dawn was there yesterday, and Matt and Eddie, of course, was presenting. Um, I saw you guys here today as well. And it's very similar, I think, in terms of what they talked about in Adi and Jenny's presentation yesterday. Um, the tasks, the reflective tasks that they, that students or the participants take part in. Um, first of all, we, we give people time to prepare, time to think about things. And then we follow very strict um, speaker listener roles. Um, so first of all, there's one speaker, one listener, and then they switch roles to listener speaker. Um, this tends to kind of organically evolve into some sort of discussion um, between the speaker and listener about the um, the topics that they've raised. And then at the end, we tend to have a little group discussion so we um, everybody gets together. Um, this is based on, like I said, cooperative development, which is um, uh, from a book by Julian Edge. Um, but it's very similar to other reflective practice principles as well. Um, some things that we really, in, we really want to highlight the difference between having just a chat and having a reflection. So this quote from O'Leary about um, the speaker is compelled to make sense of their own ideas and their reflections. And this really helps to clarify beliefs and values. And we think that this is really useful because if you've got a listener who's interrupting to offer advice or offer suggestions, it kind of reduces the amount of time that the speaker has to clarify things in their own minds. But being listened to and being well listened to is, um, has a very positive effect on the quality and the quantity of what you have to say. And it also um, helps to promote your kind of um, ability to think and your enhancement and an enhancement of self-worth as well. So we do think that um, this, this format works very well for encouraging people to reflect on their own practices. Um, yesterday in, in AD's session, somebody asked a question about, or somebody commented that um, as a listener, it's quite um, strange not to be offering advice. And um, I think that's very true that Julian Edge mentioned it as well, that there is frustration that you're not adding contributions, but um, 
his hope was that this starts to become more of a kind of a positive energy for the for the speaker. Um, that's also why we encourage the pair reflection now afterwards, because we think that that helps um, give people that opportunity to offer advice and to, to share ideas with each other. Um, now, I'm not, the, the group so far has been, um, I think has been very successful. Um, we've established it, we've kept it going for 18 months, even through patchy frequency, um, through uh, the, the kind of the pandemic that's, that's um, still going on. We had our last meeting last week um, that Mike and I both went to, and I always get a lot from the meetings and myself. So um, I think that the meetings have been very successful. And when I finished my slides um, late last night, um, I emailed myself um, with three words just to say, be more positive because I'd finished writing all of these questions and all of these challenges that I felt like we faced. But actually, I think that the meeting has, the, meet, the group is going well. Um, but that's not to say that um, I didn't have a different idea or different vision of how the community might develop. So in the next session, um, in the next section, sorry, I'm gonna reflect on a few challenges um, and pose a few questions about uh, developing a community of reflective practitioners. And I'm going to kind of frame this as ideals versus reality. So when we started the group, um, I really had this idea that everybody would, would own the group and there'd be no real leader. And maybe things could even run themselves. It would be very simple and very smooth. Um, I thought we might have multiple owners, um, anybody kind of volunteering to take to, to run the next session. Um, I thought we'd have people kind of letting us know when they'd be available, deciding together, you know, the best time, the best date. Um, I thought we'd have people suggesting different themes and offering different prompts and volunteering to lead the sessions as well. Um, I thought we might have people offering advice about the format of the sessions and how to make them kind of better for everybody. We didn't really have any of that. Um, we tried for a long time. I think Mike and, and I and, and Nick as well. We were asking for email for feedback by email. I think we sent out some Google Forms um, to get feedback on the format, but we just didn't really. We got some responses, but we didn't really get any volunteers. Um, the people who did seem interested said that they wanted to wait a little bit and maybe next year, but I think that might be a, a polite no, really. Um, I'm not blaming anybody at all. There's no obligation to do anything. It just feels, it was a different reality to what I'd kind of envisaged. Um, so at the moment, what we do is Mike tends to kind of rally the high school teachers and then I email the university teachers. Um, and I do feel a little bit some, like, I'm in, like I'm bothering people with these announcements and these reminders. Um, we've tried, I've tried things like a group chat, but that hasn't really got off the ground. Although I only started that two weeks ago. So, um, but I am kind of reluctant to limit the, the audience for these announcements because that means that people with kind of a passing interest will never really attend. So questions that I have, um, I wonder, or things that I'm wondering about, um, is it an unrealistic ideal for a new community to have everybody owning it and everybody leading it? Do we always need somebody or, or a few people to take the lead, at least at first? And I wonder in what, in what ways can a sense of ownership of a community be encouraged? I'm not gonna try and answer those questions. I'm just gonna ask them. Um, the second thing was, um, I felt was a sense of continuity between, um, between sessions and over a kind of the longer period. Um, teacher availability, often because we didn't know when teachers were available. Um, Mike, Nick and I were choosing times that suited us, choosing dates that suited us based on what other people might be available as well. But it's, we always got emails saying that people wanted to come, but they couldn't. And interest as well. Um, I don't, my assumption was that teachers would be interested and would have time to reflect and to help other people to reflect. And they'd be interested in engaging with other teachers as well. It's one hour a month usually. So I thought that was, um, Idealistically, I thought that might be doable. Um, but then when I read this from, from Steve Mann, um, 
he talks about a continuum between normal reflective practice, what, what, what teachers always do, and more structured and rigorous forms. Um, and he mentioned teacher research as, as one, um, one example, but I think there are, like a reflective practice group is more of a structured, rigorous form of reflection. And that's given me a lot of food for thought. And again, maybe it's something that we could we could be dis could, we could discuss in this session today. Um, but because of um, because these first two things perhaps don't always um, it doesn't always follow that these the teachers are available and interested in taking part in group reflection. Um, I felt like um, it was difficult to to sometimes to organize sessions because there was no real push from other teachers to, to do so. I think the longest that we went without the session was five or six months, um, sit from May to November this year. And nobody got in touch with me to ask whether we were gonna have any more. Um, and I think if we hadn't organized one, it would have just, it could have finished and we wouldn't have, um, nobody would ever mention it again, which is a bit sad, but, um, I think the sense of momentum is really important. Um, in reality, we have, I think, a, a core of a few teachers who attend most sessions, and we have a kind of semi-frequent few more people, and we have a lot of one-time attendees, um, which I think is actually part of the problem, that if people come once, they see that there isn't really a community, so they don't feel like they're joining a kind of active group, and then they think, well, well, it's probably not worth going next time because I had to introduce myself to all these people. And um, it doesn't feel like you're joining an active group. You, you feel, it feels like you're always beginning at, this, at, the, at the start, perhaps. So I was wondering, how could teachers on the normal end of the continuum, normal being what, um, referring to this quote from Bailey here, um, be encouraged to engage in a reflective community? Should they be encouraged to engage in a reflective community. And um, I guess the question, the main question there is what role does continuity or momentum play in community? And my final point is about the purpose of the group. Now, very selfishly, I get a lot from the group. So for me, it just helps me to facilitate um, individual reflection. I, I'm not good at um, journal writing. I'm not good at reflecting alone, really. Um, not on a deeper level, um, but I do. I think I reflect a lot better with others. Um, so for me, the first two there are, are very relevant. Um, the purpose of the group, I think, also is to help colleagues to become more actively reflective. Possibly in the longer term, developing connections between teachers across context and um, and within context as well, within the university, but also within um, between the high school and the university and ultimately to kind of develop a community of reflective practitioners. Or is it? I don't really know. I mean, what is the purpose of, of a community? Um, you can't force people to attend these kind of things. Um, they have to develop organically. But um, I was wondering what kind of role we play as colleagues or maybe as managers. What role do we play? What responsibility do we have for the development of other teachers and for the development of a community in our workplace? I'm asking the questions because there's, we're going to have a discussion about this. Um, if any of these questions seem interesting, please feel free to to raise them when we when we um, when we do have the discussion soon. Um, there's the citations that I mentioned um, in the talk, and um, thanks. The font um, I don't know as a slight aside. The font that I used in this presentation is called Ubuntu, which is often translated as "I am" because we are. And I thought that was quite appropriate for this talk. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Peter. There's so much to unpack there and I'm looking forward to doing so. I often use Ubuntu, but I had no idea it meant that it's perfect for the forum. Um, all right, I'd like to pass it on to our next speaker then, who is Daniel Hooper of Kanda University of International Studies. Dan? Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, everyone can hear me, I assume. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Um, so today I'm gonna be telling you about something called action logs. Um, this is something I stole from Tim Murphy, um, but 
I'm going to tell you about how action logs kind of helped mediate my teacher development and my transition between two very different teaching contexts. So first of all, we'll start with a little background. What on earth are action logs? And um, yeah, what context did I use them? So to put it simply, action logs are kind of student feedback forms that they complete after every class that I teach. And I collect them, they compile them in a notebook, you can see on the right here, and I collect them once every week. So within the action logs, it's very small, there'll be a bigger picture later, but they kind of set goals for themselves, they evaluate each lesson stage, and in my opinion, most importantly, they provide kind of open feedback on course content, my teaching style, things they're experiencing outside of class. So everything, basically. Um, and then when I collect and check their action logs, this feedback is kind of an iterative cycle. It kind of informs my lesson planning and even my teaching style. So here's uh, my template, but this is constantly evolving. The action log as a community artifact using Wenger's terms, something created by the community. Um, this is also constantly evolving based on student feedback. So next year, this will be different potentially, depending on what I hear from students. And this is really nice because it gives students a kind of tangible, kind of proof, tangible proof that I'm listening to them. So um, for example, they set how much English they want to use in class. Did they reach that target at the top? Then I will write on the board or on an online document each lesson stage, and they will rate it in terms of how interesting, how difficult, or how useful they thought it was. Um, I reinforce constructive criticism. So they're not just saying, oh, it was wonderful. Um, if they give me a critical comment, I say, oh, I got a really awesome comment from someone today, you know, especially at the start of the semester. Um, free comments and then what they want to do better next time. So my study um, in terms of my research paper, I started in a Kiowa where I taught for a long time and I transitioned into university teaching. And this was a big deal for me. So I kind of wanted to explore how action logs kind of mediated my transition. So I did a one year study. I collected student action logs from one sophomore class for a year, after which I used kind of inductive thematic coding, um, kind, of ground, kind of grounded theory. And kind of intertwined with that, I took a kind of reflective autoethnographic approach as well. So one of the first main categories that I, that I kind of took from the data was the pedagogical roles that action logs kind of had for me. So what did they do? First of all, they gave me really useful feedback on lesson activities. So I introduced these kind of short 10 to 15 minute warm up activities, basically communicative tasks, dictogloss, picture dictation, that kind of thing. So um, I took these directly from a Kiowa and I got really good feedback on them. They said they helped to kind of turn on students' brains at the start of the class. And on the other hand, we had a set textbook we had to use that students by and large, not despised, but close. Um, and they said that actually the warm up activities helped kind of mitigate the textbook work. And it actually helped them concentrate more on what we had to do with the textbook. In terms of a learning environment, one of the um, important points I got from action logs, it actually helped me to apply research findings to a class. So I read a paper about using breaks in a 90 minute class to um, increase levels of student concentration. So 90 minutes is too long to concentrate, basically. So it, rather than just saying, well, it came from a research paper, it must work. I asked the students via their action logs. And rather than saying what I expected, 
which was, oh, we want 20 minute breaks or something. The students actually said, no, two or three minutes is great. Um, some actually said maybe we could do some like power poses or stretching, like some really, really constructive feedback. Um, so yeah, I was able to, based on student data essentially, introduce and evolve our class, introduce this idea and evolve our practice. Um, the biggest issue was maybe English only. Uh, I'm sure none of you have read my papers, but on the off chance you have, I'm, uh, it sounds weird, I'm a fan of native speakerism. I hate it, but I'm a fan of researching it. So um, naturally, I was opposed to the idea of an English only class, going back to like Philipson, you know, linguistic imperialism and all of that, right? Um, but lots of students wanted it. So what we were able to do then is kind of related to Peter's presentation, have a dialogue. We were able to work through this together and come to a community decision. So we, we worked out uh, kind of compromise together. Another thing was the idea of homework. And um, so I'm sure all of you can kind of empathize. When we teach, it's just like chaos. We miss so much. And I was missing that loads of students were struggling with the homework and they needed more time to check. So um, I was able to get all of this stuff, which was kind of under the radar for me. Students kind of flagged these issues. And before they turned into like dissatisfaction or resentment, I was able to address them. Okay. Um, finally, I only saw students in class. So their lives, you know, the portrait of them as individuals was missing. So I was able to learn about things like university requirements for like study abroad stuff, which because I was a newbie in this community of practice, they were sophomore students, they were relative senpai to me within this sphere. So I was able to understand kind of where they're coming from, what their dreams were, you know, their ideal imagined L2 selves, like things like this and tailor my instruction to that. So the other ca main category I looked at was kind of more my professional identity and how this changed due to transition. And in Zitun, she's a sociocultural theory researcher, rupture. Rupture is kind of the tensions we experience in transitioning, kind of what Matthew was talking about with his nursing situation. So um, one of the main issues relating to my teacher identity was my kind of, I guess the common parlance now would be like performative role. So linked to my native speakers and research, I was very kind of aware of the stereotype of the kind of wacky gaijin, like the foreign teacher who's more like a charisma man, like an entertainer teacher. And Coming from a Kiowa, which unfairly, in my opinion, gets saddled with a lot of this stigma, um, as you'll see in my presentation tomorrow, nudge, 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 forum with Rufi, who is attending as well. Um, I was very, very aware of this and quite sensitive to it at the time. So students were saying like, oh, we want more games, we want more communicative activities, but this was fundamentally an academic reading course. So again, rather than acquiesce to their demands and rather than like getting them to acquiesce to mine, again, through dialogue, we negotiated via using the action logs as a community artifact. We used this to kind of work through this issue together. So all of this is communities of practice theory. So Matthew in his presentation talked about boundary encounters, landscapes of practice. Wendy talked about the idea of like near peer role models or old timers in Wenger's terms. Peter talked about different levels of participation in a community. All of this is Wenger. And I'm gonna kind of continue with this. Um, I was aligning with my community through these action logs, but alignment is not acquiescence, it's negotiation. So everyone is happy. Um, another function was avoiding autopilot. And this goes back into kind of more what Peter was saying, like Dewey and Schoen, reflective practice, avoiding routinization of, 
practice. Students' comments kept me on my toes. I couldn't, you know, sit back and just cruise because they would introduce something new and I'm like, oh no, bloody hell, I'm doing that. I have to change it. So that was stimulating. And also most relevant to my presentation tomorrow as well, there is no higher and lower teaching knowledge. My students convinced me that my knowledge that I developed across a landscape of practice in my community as an Aikaiwa teacher was legitimate within the hallowed halls of academia, right? So if it works, it's legitimate. So that really gave me a boost. So finally, what does action logging contribute to teaching? So this wonderful but very short quote from Karen Johnson, what works in a class, it depends, right? Not we should use TBLT or we should use, you know, Suggestopedia or whatever. Talk to your students, they know. And, but also don't discount your knowledge either, right? You, most of us have like lots of experience training. So let's work it out together. And this comes back to the idea of aligning with your community of practice through dialogue. Making alignment basically means kind of aligning your efforts to get the result that everyone expects. Okay. Um, also related to Peter's presentation as well, cheers is Walsh and Mann, their call for data-based and dialogic reflective practice. Action logs, when I checked them every Friday, it was 20 notebooks of data that I could read through. And then I would bring that data back to class the next week and discuss it with students, dialogue. We need to base our reflection on something and with someone. And then, for me, the most important point that I would like you all to remember is that action logging is not a tool, it's a responsibility, okay? For example, if students ask me to give them extra time to check their homework and I give it to them the following week, that is proof that their voice has value. I'm proving to them that they have agency in my class. Conversely, if I ignore them, I prove to them that they have no voice. So I would not suggest doing action logging if you're not committed to it. Okay, you can't just start it because it, it has the potential to cause damage. So basically through our action, we prove that their voices matter. Through our inaction, we prove, we prove that they are voiceless. So, um, Thank you all for listening. Um, I published this article in Language Teaching Research. The link is here. I'll share the slides later if people would like. This is behind a paywall. So if your institution does not have access, you can sneakily check out the preprint on ResearchGate, which is basically identical without the fancy header. So um, both links are here, or if you'd like to talk to me about it, here's my email. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Dan, and, and thank you for making those connections with the other speakers today. Um, I'm sorry, I went out of the order of the abstracts, I realized. So um, uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Don Lukovic of the University of Nagano to offer the final presentation. Don. Okay, good morning, and thank you for sticking with us in this forum today. Um, Basically, I want to ask you, what have you learned from this community? And today I will talk about what I have learned from this community and how we can teach others in this community as well. Um, I hope that this presentation today answers a few of the questions that have been posed by the previous speakers and raises, of course, some new questions that we can talk about right after this presentation. First, I should probably talk about the two directions that I'm coming from. Um, when I think about an academic service community and all, particularly the form and function of it, uh, first, we are a community of practice. And that means we are a group of people who come together uh, to discuss some kind of shared interest or passion. And we learn, as Peter was saying earlier, through interaction. 
So it's not necessarily solo, it's not keeping a log or keeping a journal, but it's through talking and discussing together. Um, also today, I'll be talking about uh, the principles of a discourse community. Uh, discourse community it has some shared principles which make us work together and function together as a community. And it covers entering, participating in, and exiting a community. And I think some of those things are not really talked about. And I especially want to focus on entering the community today. So a discourse community, if you're not familiar, uh, we must have some shared goals if we are to function as a discourse community. I think our shared goals, uh, our shared goal is that we want to further education in Japan. Uh, second, we must have different ways to communicate. In our case, we might use email or social media. We must have ways to participate in the community. And I think the best example is probably this international conference. Ways to participate, discuss, interact, and get feedback from each other. Um, fourth, we have to use some shared genres. Um, genres of academia, you know, we have newsletters, we have academic journals, we have the post-conference uh, publication for this uh, particular conference, uh, and we have to have some shared vocabulary or shared lexis. So we have to be able to know what does reflective practice mean, what is a discourse community, um, what are L2 imagined identities. And then finally, we have to have some kind of structure to the community. Um, we do have to have some kind of organization and we have to have the appropriate people to staff that structure. So the entering the community part is maybe the important part and not as talked about. We often talked about participating or being part of a discourse community, but how do we become members of a discourse community? And first, Levin Wenger talk about legitimate peripheral participation. And that is when you might be a member, but you're kind of hovering at the edges and you're not fully active or not fully engaged, perhaps. So I think that one of the main things or main challenges for us is how do we move from legitimate peripheral participation to being active or core members of community? Um, secondly, when we enter a community, that target discourse community, we usually share some kind of belief, values, vocabulary, and processes with other members of that community. And then finally, what does it take to become initiated into a community? And that's something that I really want to talk about today um, because we don't have a formal pathway to become a member. Uh, right now, it's we sign up, we register for the conference, we pay our dues, and we are a member. But there is not a formal initiation or inauguration. And I think that we should think about how to do that in a formal manner. So things from my personal experience in this particular academic service community. Um, first, as a non-member, I think people around me were already members of JOLT or other teaching organizations or other academic service organizations in Japan. And they often encouraged me either through explicit, oh, are you going to the conference? Or through more, more subtle ways, oh, I, I'm presenting here, or what do you think about this? Or I heard this interesting presentation last week. Um, and also, I think that we need to learn from near peer role models. Um, in fact, my first presentation as a peripheral member, I think, of the academic service com community was a co-presentation with one of my graduate school classmates. And I think that really kickstarted my participation in the academic service community. And I think that's very important and that we should be encouraging that. Um, in addition, I was also co-chair of the grants uh, committee in vocabulary SIG. And I think that was another really good way to become a more active member in the community because I had a built-in sounding board. So I didn't have to worry about going at it alone. So I think that shared responsibility or um, some kind of shadowing in some way is really important to move from being a non-member to a peripheral member or from a peripheral member to a more active member. And Finally, as an active member, I think it's really important that we think about innovation and think about changing the things that have been done before, because now that we ha might have more experience or more authority or more perspective of the organization that we're in, we can go ahead and make some changes. So for me, I've originated some officer roles. One was an outreach officer, which started in Tokyo chapter and which is now uh, part of the regional affairs committee. Um, and I think in the future we'll, should become a national officer role. Another thing is to think of ways to establish something 
and then perhaps, for example, establish the rules of an officer, what they need to do, how they need to do it, and then go ahead and cultivate someone for that position or to create a position specifically with someone in mind and then have them fill it. So I think as an active member or a more experienced member, you can go ahead and do those things. So that's part of the groundbreaking then cultivating part. And then finally, just general encouragement, um, encouraging the people around us to do these things as well. Um, our peers, uh, new people who might be hanging around the edges of the periphery and invite them in. So I thought about these three active or three components and I frame them in something that we should teach as members of the community. So previously I talked a little bit about what I learned from the community and now here are the, th the three ways that I think that we should be thinking about teaching others in the community. So particularly for non-members, I think we need to make them see the benefits of joining an academic service community. And that can be through sharing our own personal experiences in the community, as well as how they can uh, develop their own skills in that community, basically upskill and uh, perhaps mm, what enhance their CV, those kinds of things, and to share their own knowledge. Um, I think it's important to meet people where they are. So we often say meet learners where they are, but I think that also goes in the academic service community. Not everyone is ready to jump up on stage and give a plenary. Not everyone is ready to organize a conference and that's fine. I think that we need to be able to say, you have something of value. And I think Daniel talked about that in his presentation, right? You give value, you legitimize someone's participation by acknowledging, oh, you did this, great job. Um, secondly, for peripheral members, I think we need to help them develop their skills. And I think we need to have a formal way to do that. Um, right now, I think people come to positions of authority or to their roles in many, many different ways, but there's not a formal way to do that or to develop um, skills inside our community yet. And then also that goes hand in hand with discovering future possibilities. So right now I'm you know, kind of an active member in this SIG, how do I go from, from this, where I am now, to what I want to do in the future? And I think that ties into a lot of um, imagined future identities. So how do I see myself in the future? And then finally, for active members, um, as I was saying before, I think because people have a lot of experience and authority, they should be the people who are creating and innovative, innovating and basically creating space for non-members and new members and peripheral members to inhabit. And that includes, um, as Wendy was saying in her video, mentoring. Um, I think that's a huge part of this uh, community and process. And I think that it should be formalized. And in the same way, also orienting new members, because right now we might uh, sign up, pay our registration fee, and then we'll get in an email that says, welcome to the community. But right now, what does that mean? Um, who are the other people in the community? And uh, research has shown that cohort models are extremely powerful in making sure to retain students. So why couldn't we apply the same kind of thinking to retaining and uh, members? So those are three things that I think that we should do, depending on where you might be, things that uh, we should teach other people in the organization. So in short, how can we better build community inside our academic service community? So first, um, some people like to call this the vampire step, but you basically have to explicitly invite people in. Um, why don't you come to this conference? Or there's something that you might enjoy. Here's a presentation that really links up to what you're doing in your classroom. Um, I think that many non-members, I think as Peter was saying earlier, that people are waiting for that invitation, right? Waiting um, to be asked in. And in my Toastmasters club, they always acknowledge and recognize new members and guests. They call them most welcome guests. And they have people join in from their very first meeting and they are made to feel like members and active participants from the very first day. There's not a lot of time between becoming a, a non-member and a peripheral member in that particular community. And I think that shortening that time is perhaps very important. Um, second, as I was uh, saying before, some kind of formal system uh, for doing things, welcoming and orienting people. And I think a really good example is the uh, newcomers orientation that actually happened right after the plenary. 
And that was something new and innovative for this year. And then I often see at international conferences that they have a, an orientation for people who are new to the conference or maybe perhaps new members. And that's a really great way to one, um, share many of those functions of a discourse community with a large number of new people at once. And two, they get to meet other people who are also new to the community. And I think that's incredibly important. And three, it recognizes and acknowledges that you are new and we understand that you might not know everything. And also it, it introduces them to more senior people who they can then go to and ask questions for. So I think all of these things are very important. Three, uh, need for documented pathways. And by giving presentations about my own pathway through the academic service community and through my career, I hope to give one example of how you might progress. And I think hearing other people's stories today in the forum is also equally important. And I think that we should formalize that in some way, either through more people sharing their stories, um, through something more formal saying, okay, first you should do co-presentation and next you should be um, co-chair of something and then you become the chair. And I think having that kind of established pathway is very important for some people. Um, as Wendy was saying, formal mentoring is incredibly important and she did a really great job of laying out how, to, how you might find a mentor and how your relationship with them might work and the many different ways of mentoring that exist. Um, she mentioned that she had a very uh, close relationship with someone in person, but some people might not feel comfortable with that or some people might not be able to have uh, a mentor in their workplace. So also finding someone perhaps remotely or through social media could be very important. And I think that that also is a very important part uh, point for us to consider. So uh, today, my questions for the discussion time are who around me can I assist and how can I do so? So perhaps as you move through the conference, you might meet people who are new to JOLT or new to the conference or who are not members and who have just joined the conference. So I think welcoming them and persuading them to join would be good. So that's point number two, who around me is new and how can I welcome them? Um, and then three, how about for you? How can you engage more deeply with this community? And what do you also need? Because um, as Matthew was saying earlier, there is some element of re reciprocity in the relationship. It's not just purely one way. You can't take, 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 but you also can't give, give, give. So I think that that's something that we all need to individually reflect on for ourselves. So thank you very much for today. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Don, and thank you to all of our speakers. I'm gonna jump as soon as possible to just some uh, discussion problems. They might not be necessary. Um, the presenters have given a lot of great questions uh, where you can start from as well, but just in general, um, what resonated with you from the presentations today and how might you implement these ideas to foster community in your own workplace? Um, I've put together some breakout rooms uh, with the assumption that everyone will be an active participant, but I also respect your wishes if you would rather uh, reflect individually and not join the room. In that case, um, if, if you find you're in a room with no one, just raise your hand and I'll reshuffle them. Um, we can take eight minutes and then I'll call you back two minutes before the forum ends so that we can just uh, have a final share. All right, um, please uh, discuss. Hi, Ellis. We'll, um, Michael. Sorry, sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Um, you uh, may I, have joined after. Yes. I will be the host after that meeting from twelve fifteen. Okay. The kind of break um, break time, and I will be the host during that break time. So before you leave, you just give me the host. Yes, we'll do that. Thank you. So I'm around, and now I'm disappearing again. It was very interesting, by the way. Oh, yeah. Thank you for coming. I'm gonna join. The others don't want to join? Uh, yeah, I, I figured that might happen and that's okay. But it looks like there's at least two people in every group. So I'm gonna join one of the groups with few members. Oh, do you recommend me one group where I could go? Oh, I did send you to one group. Yeah, it, would you like to? 
Uh, I'm going. I know how to do it. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't take a little more time for the uh, discussion, but I think it's a good sign that all of you stayed in your breakout rooms <laughs> for the full minute. Um, hopefully nothing was cut too short. Um, and um, I regret that we couldn't um, take a little time to come together as a group and share any final thoughts together. Um, or Linda, is it okay if we go two or three minutes over time? Uh, yes, it's okay. It's okay. Not, uh, breakout time. Okay, yeah, we, we will finish very soon. Um, and uh, if you need to run off to, to grab a bite, um, don't feel guilty about uh, leaving right now. But if there was anything interesting from your group discussions or from your personal reflections, could you leave uh, a one-line comment in the chat? And maybe I could ask two or three people to, to just share those ideas with the full group before we, before we uh, end the forum. You can be in the room really until uh, three, 12 35 or 12 40 even. Okay, yeah, well, um, it's been 90 minutes. I'll, I'll, I'd like to not hold you too much longer. So, so definitely by 12 20, we'll try to finish. Mm -hmm. All right, so Don. I think volunteered Annette to speak up about making leadership more approachable and accessible. Annette, would you mind um, sharing in some more depth what you spoke about with Don? We were just talking about having some kind of like fireside chat with sort of doubt leaders and things like once a month. Um, and I think especially for newcomers, it, it's good to sort of make leaders more accessible so that people know what a leadership role is so that they don't feel so, so daunted about taking them on. And um, just, yeah, in, especially when you're new to a community, you're trying to, you, you think these people are like so famous, right? You see the names of these people all the time and, and just a, a chance to, to get to know them in a, a kind of casual setting would be a, a good idea. Thanks, and that seems especially um, feasible with a, a conference like this one online, where we're all yeah. just you know casually at home anyway. Um, I was in the group with uh, Dan and Ruth, and Ru Ruth had some interesting points about communities with younger learners, which didn't come up in the forum. Ruth, is it okay if I volunteer you to just uh, share briefly the kind of unique features of, of young communities? Sure. Um... Yeah, well, I was responding to Daniel's uh, talk about the responsibility of doing something like action logs. And many of us do action logs. We don't necessarily call them that. Um, but in my case, I do things on a platform called Padlet. And it's really close communication with the students and with their mothers. So for me, um, it's an even deeper connection. I have the student and the student's work that I'm looking at or the student's uh, speaking that I'm watching on video. 
but in the case of young learners, uh, my comments are directed to the learner, but I know that the mother is going to be reading them because I'm using kanji and I'm communicating to the mother in their language. So it takes a huge amount of time and some stress on my part. But what Daniel said is if you don't do it, you're telling the learner they have no voice. They just wasted their time doing their homework because you are not going to give them the feedback um, that they need to feel valued and to do a better job next time. So a lot of my feedback is not on right or wrong. It's like what I liked about it. I say, oh, this was interesting. I liked this. And if it's a kindergartner, it's like, I like the dog you drew or something that means something to the child. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> I feel like uh, this forum, I, I didn't think much about the timing within the weekend uh, when we received it, but in retrospect, it's really good that it was placed so early in the week end because I feel like this raised so many questions that hopefully we'll be able to kind of sort through as we listen to more presentations over the next few days. So with that, I'd like to officially uh, close the forum. Can we uh, say thank you one more time to the presenters and to Doug for facilitating this? Uh, thank you for everyone. Okay, if you could unmute yourself so we could hear you clap, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. I thought and it was thank a great you, presentation. Thank you to everybody who's presenting. I, I enjoyed being actually part of a breakout room too. Uh, and please enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm going to stop the recording now.